Book twenty, chapters one through six of the City of God. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darren L. Slider, www.logoslibrary.org. The City of God by Saint Augustine of Hippo, Book twenty, Chapter one. Intending to speak, in dependence on God's grace, of the day of his final judgment, and to affirm it against the ungodly and incredulous, we must first of all lay, as it were, in the foundation of the edifice, the divine declarations. Those persons who do not believe such declarations do their best to oppose to them false and elusive sophisms of their own, either contending that what is adduced from Scripture has another meaning, or altogether denying that it is an utterance of God's. For I suppose no man who understands what is written and believes it to be communicated by the supreme and true God through holy men, refuses to yield and consent to these declarations, whether he orally confesses his consent, or is from some evil influence ashamed or afraid to do so, or even, with an opinionativeness closely resembling madness, makes strenuous efforts to defend what he knows and believes to be false against what he knows and believes to be true. That, therefore, which the whole church of the true God holds and professes as its creed, that Christ shall come from heaven to judge quick and dead, this we call the last day, or last time, of the divine judgment. For we do not know how many days this judgment may occupy, but no one who reads the scriptures, however negligently, need be told that in them day is customarily used for time. And when we speak of the day of God's judgment, we add the word last or final for this reason, because even now God judges, and has judged from the beginning of human history, banishing from paradise, and excluding from the tree of life, those first men who perpetrated so great a sin. Yea, he was certainly exercising judgment also when he did not spare the angels who sinned, whose prince, overcome by envy, seduced men after being himself seduced. Neither is it without God's profound and just judgment that the life of demons and men, the one in the air, the other on earth, is filled with misery, calamities, and mistakes. And even though no one had sinned, it could only have been by the good and right judgment of God that the whole rational creation could have been maintained in eternal blessedness by a persevering adherence to its Lord. He judges, too, not only in the mass, condemning the race of devils and the race of men to be miserable on account of the original sin of these races, but he also judges the voluntary and personal acts of individuals. For even the devils pray that they may not be tormented, which proves that without injustice they might either be spared or tormented according to their deserts. And men are punished by God for their sins often visibly, always secretly, either in this life or after death, although no man acts rightly save by the assistance of divine aid, and no man or devil acts unrighteously save by the permission of the divine and most just judgment. For as the Apostle says, There is no unrighteousness with God. And as he elsewhere says, His judgments are inscrutable, and his ways past finding out. In this book, then, I shall speak, as God permits, not of those first judgments, nor of these intervening judgments of God, but of the last judgment, when Christ is to come from heaven to judge the quick and the dead. For that day is properly called the day of judgment, because in it there shall be no room left for the ignorant questioning why this wicked person is happy, and that righteous man unhappy. In that day true and full happiness shall be the lot of none but the good, while deserved and supreme misery shall be the portion of the wicked, and of them only. CHAPTER Two. In this present time we learn to bear with equanimity the ills to which even good men are subject, and to hold cheap the blessings which even the wicked enjoy. And consequently, even in those conditions of life in which the justice of God is not apparent, his teaching is salutary. For we do not know by what judgment of God this good man is poor, and that bad man rich. Why, he who, in our opinion, ought to suffer acutely for his abandoned life, enjoys himself, 
while sorrow pursues him whose praiseworthy life leads us to suppose he should be happy, why the innocent man is dismissed from the bar not only unavenged, but even condemned, being either wronged by the iniquity of the judge, or overwhelmed by false evidence, while his guilty adversary, on the other hand, is not only discharged with impunity, but even has his claims admitted, why the ungodly enjoys good health, while the godly pines in sickness, why ruffians are of the soundest constitution, while they who could not hurt any one, even with a word, are from infancy afflicted with complicated disorders, why he who is useful to society is cut off by premature death, while those who, as it might seem, ought never to have been so much as born, have lives of unusual length, why he who is full of crimes is crowned with honours, while the blameless man is buried in the darkness of neglect. But who can collect or enumerate all the contrasts of this kind? But if this anomalous state of things were uniform in this life, in which, as the sacred psalmist says, man is like to vanity, his days as a shadow that passeth away, so uniform that none but wicked men won the transitory prosperity of earth, while only the good suffered its ills, this could be referred to the just and even benign judgment of God. We might suppose that they who were not destined to obtain those everlasting benefits which constitute human blessedness, were either deluded by transitory blessings as the just reward of their wickedness, or were in God's mercy consoled by them, and that they who were not destined to suffer eternal torments were afflicted with temporal chastisement for their sins, or were stimulated to greater attainment in virtue. But now, as it is, since we not only see good men involved in the ills of life, and bad men enjoying the good of it, which seems unjust, but also that evil often overtakes evil men, and good surprises the good, the rather on this account are God's judgments unsearchable, and his ways past finding out. Although, therefore, we do not know by what judgment these things are done or permitted to be done by God, with whom is the highest virtue, the highest wisdom, the highest justice, no infirmity, no rashness, no unrighteousness, yet it is salutary for us to learn to hold cheap such things, be they good or evil, as they attach indifferently to good men and bad, and to covet those good things which belong only to good men, and flee those evils which belong only only to evil men. But when we shall have come to that judgment, the date of which is called peculiarly the day of judgment, and sometimes the day of the Lord, we shall then recognize the justice of all God's judgments, not only of such as shall then be pronounced, but of all which take effect from the beginning, or may take effect before that time. And in that day we shall also recognize with what justice so many, or almost all, the just judgments of God in the present life defy the scrutiny of human sense or insight, though in this matter it is not concealed from pious minds that what is concealed is just. CHAPTER three. Solomon, the wisest king of Israel, who reigned in Jerusalem, thus commences the book called Ecclesiastes, which the Jews number among their canonical scriptures. Vanity of vanities, said Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he hath taken under the sun? And after going on to enumerate, with this as his text, the calamities and delusions of this life, and the shifting nature of the present time, in which there is nothing substantial, nothing lasting, he bewails among the other vanities that are under the sun, this also, that though wisdom excelleth folly, as light excelleth darkness, and though the eyes of the wise man are in his head, while the fool walketh in darkness, yet one event happeneth to them all that is to say, in this life under the sun, unquestionably alluding to those evils which we see befall good and bad men alike. He says further that the good suffer the ills of life as if they were evil doers, and the bad enjoy the good of life as if they were good. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men, to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. 
This wisest man devoted this whole book to a full exposure of this vanity, evidently with no other object than that we might long for that life, in which there is no vanity under the sun, but verity under him who made the sun. In this vanity, then, was it not by the just and righteous judgment of God that man, made like to vanity, was destined to pass away? But in these days of vanity it makes an important difference whether he resists or yields to the truth, and whether he is destitute of true piety or a partaker of it. Important not so far as regards the acquirement of the blessings or the evasion of the calamities of this transitory and vain life, but in connection with the future judgment which shall make over to good men good things, and to bad men bad things, in permanent inalienable possession. In fine, this wise man concludes this book of his by saying, Fear God, and keep his commandments, for this is every man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every despised person, whether it be good, or whether it be evil. What truer, terser, more salutary announcement could be made? Fear God, he says, and keep his commandments, for this is every man. For whosoever has real existence is this, is a keeper of God's commandments, and he who is not this is nothing. For so long as he remains in the likeness of vanity, he is not renewed in the image of the truth. For God shall bring into judgment every work, that is, whatever man does in this life, whether it be good or whether it be evil, with every despised person, that is, with every man who here seems despicable, and is therefore not considered. For God sees even him, and does not despise him, nor pass over him in his judgment. CHAPTER Four. The proofs, then, of this last judgment of God which I propose to adduce shall be drawn first from the New Testament, and then from the Old. For although the Old Testament is prior in point of time, the New has the precedence in intrinsic value, for the Old acts the part of herald to the New. We shall therefore first cite passages from the New Testament, and confirm them by quotations from the Old Testament. The Old contains the Law and the Prophets, the New the Gospel and the Apostolic Epistles. Now the Apostle says, by the law is the knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now the righteousness of God is by faith of Jesus Christ upon all them that believe. This righteousness of God belongs to the New Testament, and evidence for it exists in the old books, that is to say, in the law and the prophets. I shall first, then, state the case, and then call the witnesses. This order Jesus Christ himself directs us to observe, saying, The scribe instructed in the kingdom of God is like a good householder, bringing out of his treasure things new and old. He did not say old and new, which he certainly would have said had he not wished to follow the order of merit, rather than that of time. CHAPTER five. The Saviour himself, while reproving the cities in which he had done great works, but which had not believed, and while setting them in unfavourable comparison with foreign cities, says, But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And a little after he says, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Here he most plainly predicts that a day of judgment is to come. And in another place he says, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the words of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Two things we learn from this passage, that a judgment is to take place, and that it is to take place at the resurrection of the dead. For when he spoke of the Ninevites and the queen of the south, he certainly spoke of dead persons, and yet he said that they should rise up in the day of judgment. He did not say, They shall condemn, as if they themselves were to be the judges, but because, in comparison with them, the others shall be justly condemned. 
again in another passage in which he was speaking of the present intermingling and future separation of the good and bad the separation which shall be made in the day of judgment he adduced a comparison drawn from the sown wheat and the tares sown among them and gave this explanation of it to his disciples he that soweth the good seed is the son of man etc here indeed he did not name the judgment or the day of judgment but indicated it much more clearly by describing the circumstances and foretold that it should take place in the end of the world in like manner he says to his disciples verily i say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the son of man shall sit on the throne of his glory ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of israel here we learn that jesus shall judge with his disciples and therefore he said elsewhere to the jews if i by beelzebub cast out devils by whom do your sons cast them out therefore they shall be your judges neither ought we to suppose that only twelve men shall judge along with him though he says that they shall sit upon twelve thrones for by the number twelve is signified the completeness of the multitude of those who shall judge for the two parts of the number seven which commonly symbolizes totality that is to say four and three multiplied into one another give twelve for four times three or three times four are twelve there are other meanings too in this number twelve were not this the right interpretation of the twelve thrones then since we read that matthias was ordained an apostle in the room of judas the traitor the apostle paul though he labored more than them all should have no throne of judgment but he unmistakably considers himself to be included in the number of the judges when he says know ye not that we shall judge angels the same rule is to be observed in applying the number twelve to those who are to be judged for though it was said judging the twelve tribes of israel the tribe of levi which is the thirteenth shall not on this account be exempt from judgment neither shall judgment be passed only on israel and not on the other nations and by the words in the regeneration he certainly meant the resurrection of the dead to be understood for our flesh shall be regenerated by incorruption as our soul is regenerated by faith many passages i omit because though they seem to refer to the last judgment yet on a closer examination they are found to be ambiguous or to allude rather to some other event whether to that coming of the saviour which continually occurs in his church that is in his members in which he comes little by little and piece by piece since the whole church is his body or to the destruction of the earthly jerusalem for when he speaks even of this he often uses language which is applicable to the end of the world and that last and great day of judgment so that these two events cannot be distinguished unless all the corresponding passages bearing on the subject in the three evangelists matthew mark and luke are compared with one another for some things are put more obscurely by one evangelist and more plainly by another so that it becomes apparent what things are meant to be referred to one event it is this which I have been at pains to do in a letter which I wrote to Hesychius of blessed memory, Bishop of Salon, and entitled, Of the End of the World. I shall now cite from the Gospel, according to Matthew, the passage which speaks of the separation of the good from the wicked by the most efficacious and final judgment of Christ. When the Son of Man, he says, shall come in his glory, then shall he say also unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Then he in like manner recounts to the wicked the things they had not done, but which he had said those on the right hand had done. And when they ask when they had seen him in need of these things, he replies that inasmuch as they had not done it to the least of his brethren, they had not done it unto him, and concludes his address in the words, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Moreover, the evangelist John most distinctly states that he had predicted that the judgment should be at the resurrection of the dead. For after saying, the father judgeth no man but hath committed all judgment unto the son that all men should honour the son even as they honour the father he that honoureth not the son honoureth not the father which hath sent him he immediately adds 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Here he said that believers on him should not come into judgment. How then shall they be separated from the wicked by judgment, and be set at his right hand, unless judgment be in this passage used for condemnation? For into judgment in this sense they shall not come who hear his word, and believe on him that sent him. Chapter 6 After that he adds the words, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. As yet he does not speak of the second resurrection, that is, the resurrection of the body, which shall be in the end, but of the first, which now is. It is for the sake of making this distinction that he says, The hour is coming, and now is. Now this resurrection regards not the body, but the soul. For souls too have a death of their own in wickedness and sins, whereby they are the dead of whom the same lips say, Suffer the dead to bury their dead, that is, let those who are dead in soul bury them that are dead in body. It is of these dead, then, the dead in ungodliness and wickedness, that he says, The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. They that hear, that is, they who obey, believe, and persevere to the end. Here no difference is made between the good and the bad. For it is good for all men to hear his voice and live, by passing to the life of godliness from the death of ungodliness. Of this death the Apostle Paul says, Therefore all are dead, and he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose again. Thus all, without one exception, were dead in sins, whether original or voluntary sins, sins of ignorance or sins committed against knowledge, and for all the dead there died the one only person who lived, that is, who had no sin whatever, in order that they who live by the remission of their sins should live not to themselves, but to him who died for all, for our sins, and rose again for our justification, that we, believing in him who justifies the ungodly, and being justified from ungodliness, or quickened from death, may be able to attain to the first resurrection which now is. For in this first resurrection none have a part save those who shall be eternally blessed. But in the second, of which he goes on to speak, all, as we shall learn, have a part, both the blessed and the wretched. The one is the resurrection of mercy, the other of judgment. And therefore it is written in the psalm, I will sing of mercy and of judgment, unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. And of this judgment he went on to say, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Here he shows that he will come to judge in that flesh in which he had come to be judged. For it is to show this, he says, because he is the Son of Man. And then follow the words for our purpose. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. This judgment he uses here in the same sense as a little before, when he says, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life that is, by having a part in the first resurrection, by which a transition from death to life is made in this present time, he shall not come into damnation, which he mentions by the name of judgment, as also in the place where he says, But they that have done evil under the resurrection of judgment, that is, of damnation. He therefore who would not be damned in the second resurrection, let him rise in the first. For the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live, that is, shall not come into damnation, which is called the second death. 
into which death, after the second or bodily resurrection, they shall be hurled who do not rise in the first or spiritual resurrection. For the hour is coming, but here he does not say, and now is, because it shall come in the end of the world, in the last and greatest judgment of God, when all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. He does not say, as in the first resurrection, and they that hear shall live, for all shall not live, at least with such life as ought alone to be called life, because it alone is blessed. For some kind of life they must have in order to hear, and come forth from the graves in their rising bodies. And why all shall not live, he teaches in the words that follow, they that have done good to the resurrection of life, these are they who shall live, but they that have done evil to the resurrection of judgment, these are they who shall not live, for they shall die in the second death. They have done evil because their life has been evil, and their life has been evil because it has not been renewed in the first or spiritual resurrection which now is, or because they have not persevered to the end in their renewed life. As then there are two regenerations of which I have already made mention, the one according to faith, and which takes place in the present life by means of baptism, the other according to the flesh, and which shall be accomplished in its incorruption and immortality by means of the great and final judgment, so are there also two resurrections, the one the first and spiritual resurrection, which has place in this life, and preserves us from coming into the second death, the other the second, which does not occur now, but in the end of the world, and which is of the body, not of the soul, and which by the last judgment shall dismiss some into the second death, others into that life which has no death. End of Book 20, Chapters 1 through 6 Recording by Darren L. Slider, Fort Worth, Texas, www.logoslibrary.org